Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Today, we're going to be discussing microphone selection and placement for broadcast. My name is Cheryl Jennison DeProza, and I'm joined by Bill Ostry and Ben Escobedo. And we're going to jump into this in just a few moments, but first, a few items of housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing sometime within the next one to two weeks. Um, you can find this webinar along with all of our past archive webinars at sure.com slash training. There's a lot of great webinars across a wide variety of topics, so please feel free to go to shore.com slash training, peruse our past webinars, and learn a lot. Um, second of all, as we go through the session, please feel free to type any questions you have into the question pane. If you do not see that question pane, look for a small gray toolbar. It'll probably be up in the, around the right-hand corner of your screen. And on that toolbar, you'll see an orange box with a white arrow on it. Click on that box, and that should maximize your question pane. Type in as many questions as you have, but please remember that we will get to those at the end of the session. So type those questions and be patient, and we'll answer as many as we can when we wrap up today. So that's all the housekeeping. Let's learn some stuff. Take it away, gentlemen. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ben. I have my colleague Bill with me as well, and we're, we're going to talk a little bit about microphone selection and placement for broadcast this afternoon. So let's get right into it. So the objectives at the end of this training, um, you should be able to know the basics of common microphone polar patterns and how they can be used effectively with broadcast. You will understand the commonly used microphone types for broadcast applications. We'll understand how lavalier microphones can be placed effectively on our on-air talent. And we could describe how wireless microphones are used in a broadcast studio environment. We'll also briefly touch base on the 600 megahertz spectrum changes. So introduction, um, we'll cover that. Microphone polar patterns will be the next section. Wired microphone selection and usage for broadcast will follow. Placing lavalier microphones effectively. And finally, wireless microphone selection and usage for broadcast. So uh, sure has been at the audio game for a long time. Uh, our game is pretty strong. Uh, this is a technical bulletin if you can see on your screen from 1933. Um, sure has been actively involved uh, predating the golden era of television and uh, very active in the radio broadcast. Uh, as you can see, there was field problems and microphone placement. Part one uh, broadcasting is the title of this article here. And uh, it shows that we've been very involved in helping our end users and clients and customers uh, solve their microphone and broadcast problems in general. Um, while times have changed, certainly the techniques of capturing audio have not. Uh, physics does not change over time. Uh, we have new and great technology advancements, but uh, certain things such as sound and picking up that sound uh, will remain true for the test of time. It's pretty fun to look back and see how well uh, Sure has been uh, working with the broadcasters and radio and TV in this article here. On the next slide, we see something similar uh, showing our ongoing commitment to be dedicated to supporting audio and broadcast uh, microphone selection guide from 1987. Uh, so it's got that cool 80s uh, teal blue vibe here and showing uh, the venerable SM7B and a bunch of other uh, products here. Uh, we're still continually to this day uh, with these type of products uh, you know, for broadcast and other uses as well. So we're dedicated to support. Obviously, broadcast is dependent on microphones to produce the product. The product is the broadcast itself. So whether it's radio, television, TV, et cetera, um, broadcast will remain to be dependent on these microphones to provide the sound. The product is created and captured by the microphone, and that's why it's very important to select the right one and use it in the best way possible. Um, that's why we're talking about it today. Um, sure has been involved with broadcast since before the golden age of television, which is referred to as the 40s to the 60s. So, I mean, we saw that technical bulletin was from 33. Um, we're definitely even before then and also all the way up to currently today. Since there were microphones and broadcast, uh, there has been microphone related issues needing to be resolved. So uh, we have a problem, we try to solve it, uh, we learn, we teach, we understand, uh, we get feedback from our customers, and then we try to take that feedback and uh, disseminate it all back to the general public for everybody's greater good. Um, 
the medium, what regardless of the medium, TV, radio, or internet, uh, enables the content to reach its audience. As we mentioned previously, you know, it started with radio, and that's basically the first kind of use of microphones in the broadcast world, uh, and then going to television or TV. And then now we're seeing applications such as internet and live streaming and so forth that uh, enables content to reach its audience. Um, regardless of the method of how it's used yesterday, today, and in the future, uh, a microphone will be needed uh, to capture this audio and put it out wherever it may be going. The next section we'll talk about are microphone polar patterns. This may be remedial to some, however, it's worth covering. Uh, these polar patterns are important to understand how the microphone picks up and what it can pick up and what it can't pick up. Um, used effectively, these can be some of the best tools in your toolbox. The two different types of microphones we'll start talking about are dynamic and condenser. Dynamic microphones are rugged and they handle shock very well. Um, they don't cost that much to manufacture versus their condenser counterparts, and they're also very impossible, almost impossible to be overdriven. Uh, they have a very high SPL or sound pressure level handling. Uh, they're also of a medium sensitivity, so uh, they're not likely to pick up unwanted noises uh, such as a running air conditioner or uh, air handling unit or something else that you don't want to be picking up. Uh, in that instance, it's a good blend for an all-around type of knock-around type of microphone that's very rugged, reliable, stand the test of time. Uh, sounds familiar. Uh, maybe something like the SM58 um, is a dynamic microphone and has proven itself to be extremely rugged and sounds great, uh, lasts a long time, it's very durable and so forth, um, largely because of its construction, its design, and the fact that it's a dynamic microphone. Uh, dynamic microphones are pretty simple mechanically. If you look at the bottom right of the slide, you'll see a uh, cutaway of a dynamic capsule. Uh, the diaphragm on top moves a coil, and that cylindric cylindrical item is a magnet. And just like we learned in science class in school, when you move a magnet versus a coil, it makes a small amount of electricity. Uh, this electricity is the actual audio that's being captured by the microphone, and then we route that where else it needs to go, amplify it, record it, etc. Uh, so it's the most basic of the type of microphones, but also one of the most common, just because it, it's rugged and it works very well. Moving along, we talk about its counterpart, the condenser microphone. Um, condenser microphones in general are more accurate uh, in their sound reproduction. Um, they're a little bit more delicate, uh, more fragile, if you will. They do require some source of external power. Um, this power can either be used to bias the microphone um, or it can be used to activate the FETs that uh, send the, the amplify the signal from a very low output. Uh, they have high sensitivity, so condenser microphones can pick up just about everything. Um, they're known to pick up, uh, like we talked about, air handlers or um, air conditioners or room noises or things that you normally wouldn't hear, you will hear with a condenser microphone. So they're very good at that. Um, that can be a pro and a con depending on its application. Typically condenser microphones are a little bit higher cost uh, than their dynamic counterparts because of the delicacy and uh, the way they need to be constructed. Um, they also don't handle quite as loud sound levels as dynamics. They uh, can be overdriven if you put too loud of a uh, sound source in front of them. When we talk about condenser, um, there are different camps or different types of condenser microphones we'll touch base on, uh, just so that we can speak intelligibly about them. Uh, the first type is the most common, which is the pre-polarized or electric type of condenser. Uh, these type of microphones are featured in just about everything from children's toys to cellular telephones to uh, studio microphones, you name it. Uh, the way these work is that they use a permanently polarized electret material, um, which can be a thin film of like mylar type material. Uh, usually it's heated until it's uh, melted or superfluous, and then it's bombarded with uh, magnetism. When it dries or cools down, it retains that polarization and that becomes its kind of energized backplate permanently. Uh, these microphones need DC power to work, but not for the microphone uh, to bias the backplate, like a true condenser we'll talk about, but they need a little bit of power to power the FETs that amplify that very small signal into something that's usable. Uh, these are cost effective and uh, millions and millions and millions of them are made uh, each year for various uses.
The next type is a true condenser. A uh, true condenser is kind of like your studio type of microphone. Uh, these are uh, expensive to manufacture. They typically have a gold sputtered diaphragm and a brass back plate that has to be drilled uh, acoustically. Uh, they have to be assembled in uh, very clean rooms and they do need DC power to bias or uh, energize the back plate and make uh, it have uh, some sort of uh, polarity. Uh, these are typically found in recording studios for the most part. Uh, in the broadcast realm, we do see some of them being used in a controlled studio environment. Um, but they are, again, very sensitive and, and very accurate and delicate sounding. And um, it's good to know the difference between these. The, lastly, the RF condenser uh, technology uses a low noise oscillating RF circuit. Uh, these type of microphones and RF or radio frequency condensers are found in shotgun type of microphones most commonly. Um, and uh, because of the lower capsule tension and the way they work, um, they're pretty good in uh, dusty and humidity type of environments. They're also known for being relatively true to what comes in with the sound source and what comes out. They're very flat. Um, so RF condensers are the third type of condenser to know. Now we get right into the heart of the matter. Uh, the polar patterns. We show six polar patterns on the screen here from left to right, and we'll kind of touch base on each one of them, and then we're going to dive into the ones that are most commonly found in the broadcast realm. Uh, the first one is omnidirectional, and if you look at the little polar pattern, the zero uh, dictates where the business end of the microphone is. Uh, this is the, you know, right on top, right into the grill, if you will, if it's a handheld, uh, right directly on axis. Uh, 180 degrees would be the rear of the microphone or typically on a handheld where you would plug in the cable. Omnidirectional is just like the name implies, picks up in 360 degrees, uh, kind of like a ball in all directions. The next one would be a subcardioid or also referred to as a wide cardioid. Um, this is kind of a cross between an omni and the next cardioid type. Um, it's pretty forgiving, has decent rear rejection, but not quite as uh, good as the next one, which is the cardioid. Um, the cardioid type is the most common and does have that heart shape, great rejection from the rear. Uh, and then we also get into the supercardioid, which is narrower than the cardioid, uh, the hypercardioid, which is even narrower, and then the bidirectional, which is also known as a figure eight type of microphone. Um, you can see the different degrees of uh, maximum rejection uh, below each one. And uh, as we get uh, further to the right, we get more directionality out of them. The first one we'll talk about is the omnidirectional. Uh, if you look at the drawing down below, just like the name implies, if you can visualize where the capsule is, there is a 360 degree globe. Um, so this microphone ideally picks up evenly in all directions. Uh, this type of microphone is least susceptible to wind noise um, because of its pattern. Uh, wind doesn't affect it nearly as much as other directional microphones. So it may be a good choice for broadcast for outside use or where there may be a, a windy environment. Uh, it's also the most popular type of pattern for lavalier microphones or tie clip microphones. Um, these are good because of the wide pattern and it can pick up evenly um, when a person moves their head and they're on camera or using a lavalier, uh, the sound remains even is less likely to drop off. So omnis are, are important to know about here. Secondly, we'll talk about the cardioid. Uh, cardioid is also known as a unidirectional. Um, the name of cardioid uh, is very similar to like, um, you know, the Latin for heart. So that's where it comes from. Uh, the most popular pattern of all microphones, uh, we typically, we think microphone most of the time, it's gonna be a cardioid. Uh, it's a good balance between side and rear rejection while having a little bit of forgiveness if you're off axis on the front end. So um, it's a good all around type of microphone. Um, great feedback rejection as well in live environments just due to its uh, great rear rejection. As you can see on the polar pattern directly in the middle, um, for, if you're from the rear, it has the most rejection out of all the patterns. Supercardioid, um, with every pro, there comes a con. So this one would be a little bit narrower than the cardioid. So you, when you're using a microphone like this, you do have to be more on axis or right into the, the grill of it. Um, therefore, it has better side rejection. If you look at the chart at 120 degrees on each side, uh, you have great rejection from there. But when we get the narrower pattern on the top, 
uh, and the rear of it will become what we is known as a tail. And this little lobe that sticks out of the rear of the microphone can actually pick up sounds that are coming from the rear of it. So some unwanted sounds, uh, if you're, the back of the microphone is pointing towards something, it may pick that up. Um, additionally, if it was in a live amplification environment, there's a speaker, uh, it could come back and feed back because it's picking up from the rear. So uh, something to, to note when we're talking about a narrower supercardioid pattern that you will have the production of this tail in the rear and you may have to deal with that. Um, Bill, you wanna talk a little bit about shotguns? Sure, sure. So uh, shotgun microphones um, have the ability to allow us to ignore more information uh, from the sides and uh, utilizing a uh, more narrow uh, pickup pattern. And the narrower the pickup pattern, the longer the interference tube. Um, so you can see, for as an example, we've got a short, a medium, and a long uh, example of a shotgun microphone here. Um, these have excellent side rejection. Um, it allows, allows us to capture sounds from a distance, and not necessarily that you... Uh, you want to be farther away, but sometimes you just don't have a choice to get your microphone as close as you would like. Um, so what this allows you to do is actually ignore more of the stuff, the content that are off to the sides and focus more on the information right in front of it. Um, and typically that's, uh, that's how a, a shotgun is used. Now, um, the, interference to tube, the interference tube determines how directional uh, the microphone is. And there's two bits of information that uh, help you determine um, what, which one you want to use. And one is, is called the angle of acceptance. That is uh, how wide the pickup pattern is. And the low bar frequency, which is the frequency at which it becomes directional at that, um, at that angle of acceptance. So if we go to the next slide. So if we look at a short shotgun microphone, for example... This has a pattern, uh, a pickup pattern that's a little bit more narrow than you would see on, uh, on even on a hypercardioid, for example. This is as about a 70 degree angle of acceptance. And it becomes directional right around that three, uh, three kilohertz uh, point, which means that everything in front of it, it's gonna remain directional up, till, up to that three kilohertz. Everything below it will act more like an omnidirectional because it's uh, lower in frequency content. So if we go to the next slide, we can take a peek at what a medium shotgun looks like. Now you'll see that that green has a little bit narrower pickup pattern. It's actually 50 degrees. And it becomes directional right around that 900 hertz uh, frequency. So uh, compared to the, the shorter shotgun, which has a shorter interference tube, this has a narrower, narrower uh, pickup pattern and it's directional uh, to a lower frequency. And the same holds true for a long. So if we go to a longer interference tube, you can see once again, it gets narrower. So we're down to 30 degrees uh, for the angle of acceptance. And that is effective down to 500 hertz. So that is a pretty, that's pretty awesome. Um, these are really beneficial for those, those uh, instances where you just can't get a microphone close. It's always best to get your microphone as close to your sources as possible. But sometimes if you're trying to um, pick up uh, information from talent uh, where you can't have a microphone in view of a camera, for example, uh, many times you'll see these uh, placed remotely to try and pick up um, uh, talent from a, from a distance, either above or off to the side, or even right on the camera itself. Thanks, Bill. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, mic selection next, um, handheld versus lavalier. Um, this comes up quite a bit in broadcast, and we're constantly you know, weighing the balances of what works best for the situation. Um, the first scenario we'll talk about is an interview scenario um, where a reporter may be out in the street sharing a single handheld microphone. Uh, they are walking and talking, and you know whether they're getting rained on or there's some big news event happening, um, they're one-on-one -on -one, uh, with somebody trying to share the microphone and get their side of the story as well as talking in front of the camera. Um, obviously, this type of scenario, we want to use a handheld. Uh, the handheld will allow extra reach. Uh, it's a little bit better outdoors than the uh, elements. And and we can share it easily between uh, two people or more uh, in an interview type of situation. 
Lavaliers do seem like an easy choice, um, but there are other challenges that may arise. I mean, a lot of people say, well, when we just put a lab on everybody and that's easiest, you know, um, we can mic them all up and everybody has their own lab and so forth. Um, but with that comes a lot of other challenges that may not be quite apparent at first. Uh, the first would be wind and hair noise. Uh, so a lavalier is a condenser element. Uh, typically, and uh, would be more sensitive than, say, a dynamic handheld. So it would be more susceptible to wind, especially in an outdoor environment. If you're in a studio, that's one thing, but out on the sidewalk or in a windy situation, it could be a problem. Uh, we talk about hair noise. Uh, hair noise, just not not only just brushing the hair against a condenser element or a lavalier, but um, those with long hair, uh, hair can actually find its way inside of the microphone. And if a hair touches the capsule directly, you'll get a huge bang or a pop. And that's of course undesirable. Also with a lavalier mic, we have to be cognizant of clothing noise. Uh, the clothing moving itself, depending on the type of clothing it is, can cause noises. Um, it could also be mechanical noise that may not be touching the capsule, but if it touches the cable, that noise can find its way back to the microphone and uh, ruin your recording or broadcast. Lastly, uh, just the sheer fact of attaching the lavalier to a talent can be a challenge sometimes. Uh, depending on the individual, especially high profile individuals, uh, some do not like to be touched by anybody and they have a problem with that or uh, maybe they have a special handler or one of their own uh, personal assistants, if you will, and then they're the only ones that are allowed to touch them and then the audio guy has to give the microphone to the personal assistant who doesn't have any idea how to put a lavalier on somebody and they're putting this lavalier and it's not exactly where it should be and so forth. Um, but as you can imagine, the simple act of clipping a lab on somebody can you know, be quite a challenge depending on who you're clipping it on and what the situation entails. Additionally, um, ambient noise can be a huge problem. Uh, controlled versus uncontrolled uh, environment. Uh, if we have a lot of ambient noise, uh, then a handheld may be the better choice. Um, and that's why we always see you know, outdoor broadcasts and such live on the scene is typically done with a handheld microphone. Um, in a studio environment, we can control the wind, we can control outside noises, people running through the studio and such, and we can use more sensitive mics like lavaliers with great results. All right, we'll talk a little bit about microphone selection for broadcast. Uh, in an interview scenario, which we touched base on in the previous section, um, we were looking for a microphone with broad coverage. So a super cardioid may not be the best choice here because of its narrow pattern. Most of the time, we're going to be looking at a dynamic element that's cardioid or omnidirectional. Um, this is great because when we're kind of putting the microphone and talking into it and then quickly switching to somebody else that we want to talk with, um, we don't have to be right in their face with the microphone and aim it exactly correct. Um, if you're a little bit off of the grill or off axis, you'll still get a consistent sound quality. And that's what we're looking for. Additionally, we're looking for longer length handheld a lot of times for ease of the back and forth. Um, if it's a real short microphone, it may be okay for a personal use, but if you're trying to put it in somebody else's face and get their audio, it can be a challenge. So having that extra length uh, would be welcome in this situation. Uh, we have a product uh, called the Sure Mic Flag Extender Kit, which kind of takes the same threads that all of the wireless we make does, and it can be extended much like Legos. You can screw them together and make it as long or as short as you wish. Um, it's kind of a great tool to have in your toolbox. We call it a mic flag extender kit because on the right hand of the slide, you'll notice that there's a microphone there with a flag on it, also referred to as a halo or station identifier, um, you know, the type that has the station's logo on it, uh, whether it's ESPN or CNN or whatever. Um, when you put a mic flag on a microphone, it makes the microphone itself become shorter. And especially somebody with big hands, uh, now they're going to be forced to take up more of the microphone down lower. It kind of looks a little silly and it can actually be uh, a problem when we're talking about wireless microphones, especially uh, individuals in the sports industry or have like really big hands or big football players, if you will, um, as their hand goes down towards the bottom, they may be covering the transmit antenna on a wireless handheld microphone. Um, this will hurt performance and adding a mic flag extender kit is one way to make sure there's more room for their hand to hold the microphone and work well. It sounds like a silly little thing, but in fact, it's become quite popular to have a longer microphone or at least the option uh, to have that extender kit to make things work out well. Talk a little bit about lavalier microphone usage and placement. Um, 
here in this scenario, we're looking at The Tonight Show uh, with Jimmy Fallon, and Dana Carvey is the guest. We have um, uh, Jimmy Fallon on the right, Dana Carvey on the left, and then um, we have a lavalier microphone. If we look here, we can see Dana Carvey's microphone is on his left, and it is closest to Jimmy Fallon. And this is not by accident, it's by design. Um, I may have not noticed it before, but if you think about it, when he's talking in front of the camera, um, it's a consistent distance to his mouth. But when he's also talking and joking around with uh, Jimmy Fallon or the host of the show, he's going to be turning to his left and, you know, making a lot of motions with his hands and so forth. Um, this will uh, make the sound more consistent than, say, if it was on the center of his tie or if it was on the right hand side of his jacket. So um, it's kind of interesting. You can pick apart why the A2 or the person who put that lavalier there chose to put it where they did. And if you notice, a lot of the same shows are consistent. They'll put them in the same spots uh, over and over because um, it works. And they know it works. They've done hundreds of episodes or thousands of episodes, and uh, this is perfect. So here's another situation with uh, World News Tonight here um, with David Muir on the right. And we can see his lavalier pretty clearly. Um, it's right there. Again, it's on the side closest to the guest across the desk. Uh, so when he's talking uh, across there, he's going to be leaning either forward or to his right. And we'll have more consistent distance between the lavalier and his mouth, of course. Um, the other thing is interesting is that obviously there's a lavalier on David, but on the female, where is the lavalier? Um, maybe there is one, maybe there is not. Maybe it's hidden under the the shirt. Uh, there could be another type of microphone, like a shotgun microphone just out of the shot, or maybe a plant microphone or boundary microphone or something else in the studio. Uh, I'm unsure, but it's not uncommon uh, for lavaliers to be hidden, uh, especially where it's not applicable to, you know, it would look unsightly or wouldn't blend in with the shirt or the color uh, to be hidden underneath the shirt. And then you got to think about how did that microphone get there? Who put that on the talent? You know, it's uh, kind of a private matter, of course, uh, you know, miking up somebody in this fashion. <coughs> uh, the ultimate goal is consistent distance to the sound source, and that's what we're going after here. Uh, lavalier loop. Um, this is kind of lavalier basics here. Um, but if you've ever seen this before, uh, it's a good practice to do. And just about everybody um, that uses lavaliers is aware of this technique. Uh, we put a loop uh, on the clip itself uh, with the cable for a couple of reasons. Um, the loop does help reduce mechanical noise or any clothing noise brushing on the microphone itself. Uh, provides a strain relief. So if that cable gets tugged or the actor forgets that they're wearing a, their wire and it gets pulled and it yanks out, it's more likely to stay on that clip rather than the microphone falling out. And as you can imagine, if uh, you lose a lavalier on air during a live broadcast, it's a big problem. Additionally, most of these clips have uh, two square holes, and you can see one of the square holes has the actual clip for the lav on the cable, and the one right to the left of it uh, can be used for a second lavalier, and you can double mic somebody on the same clip for a backup or just to have that peace of mind in case one lavalier fails for whatever reason. Um, is additionally, you can take these uh, clips and rotate them 90 degrees if uh, the clip has to be oriented in a you know, vertical instead of a horizontal direction. Some of the lavalier accessories that we find out there, um, from left to right, we have a magnetic mount. If you can tell, the uh, clip is on the top of the mount, and this would be on the outside of the clothing. And then the bottom of the mount would be the magnet or uh, a metal back plate that gets sandwiched in between uh, the shirt. And this is a great choice if there is something where you can't put a clip on. Uh, maybe it's a, an expensive dress or something like that, or there's just no appropriate place to put it. Uh, a magnetic mount or clip can work really well in this instance. The one in the middle is a vampire, uh, as the nickname is, or a pin clip, also referred to as a Dracula type of clip, uh, because of its two fangs, or there's two pins, uh, much like a brooch that you would wear. Uh, this can be put into just about any type of clothing, as long as you're allowed to put a couple pinholes through it, of course. Um, and then on the right, we have a medical tape. Uh, medical tape is a staple in a lot of uh, toolboxes for audio and broadcast because where we can't use a clip or there's some unique challenges, uh, we can use medical tape to directly attach the lavalier to the talent or person. 
Uh, a popular brand is Tegaderm uh, by 3M. Uh, this is pretty good uh, with um, people that are have allergies or um, other issues with having adhesives on them. It removes cleanly, it holds securely, um, doesn't leave a mess and so forth. Um, we see this not only popular with the broadcast, but the theater uh, users of lavaliers as well. All right, I'm going to talk about shotgun microphone usage and placement. I'll turn it over to Bill. Okay. So when we talk about uh, shotgun microphones, uh, especially in field production, um, it can be used several different ways. And here we, we see an example of a, a run-and-gun ENG type of application. Uh, ENG stands for electronic news gathering, or um, it can also be called EFP, electronic field production. Um, so on this, on this camera, uh, this is actually a harness, which has got a camera put plus several different devices on there. But closest to us in the upper right, uh, on the right-hand side, is a uh, shotgun microphone in a shoe mount there. And uh, it's got a little windscreen on it, so you can't quite tell exactly what it is. But it is a, it is a microphone. And um, worth noting that uh, if, if this person is actually filming uh, talent on air and they have a wireless microphone, for example... Um, they still utilize this this uh, this um, shotgun microphone as a as a secondary source for uh, for gaining the content um, in case the wireless microphone goes down, for example, or they just um, uh, they can't get an open frequency. So on the left hand side, you can see that there's actually a a wireless receiver there, um, and there's likely some uh, talent in front of this camera person. Uh, with a with a lavalier microphone or a handheld microphone, and um, most cameras actually have two two inputs, a left and a right. So many times they'll use one from the wireless and then the other one from the uh, from a wired microphone. Next, oh okay, here we go. So uh, in the sports world, many times shotgun microphones are used uh, out in in uh, open spaces uh, for uh, for their directional characteristics and their directional properties. Uh, for example, on the left side here, you see uh, this this lady here with a shotgun microphone in her hand. Um, you can't quite tell it's a shotgun microphone because it's in the, inside this uh, this uh, um, enclosure that is help, uh, meant to help reduce wind uh, uh, from getting into the microphone, but also um, protect it from the elements. So below that fuzzy material is uh, is a more rigid a contraption many times it's called like a zeppelin where in t inside of it it's got a shock mount that holds that uh that shotgun microphone you can tell that that one's a pretty long one um, and then they cover it with this uh this fuzzy uh material um uh, it's many kind many times called a wind jammer or also uh, funny enough it's called the uh, uh the dead cat um and what that allows that person to do is actually focus that microphone in the direction of the uh, the content that they're trying to uh, pick up. So, for example, if, if they've got a lot of people over, up on the hill there making a lot of noise, she, that person right there, she doesn't want to pick up those people. She wants to focus on uh, whoever the golfer is, maybe to uh, capture the putting uh, sound, the sound of the putter hitting the ball, um, whatever it might be. Now, up on the, on the right side, we see at a tee box, there is actually a fixed... Um, shotgun microphone aimed at where the golfers will be teeing off. And unlike the pistol grip that the lady is using on the left, this one is fixed. And it's pointed in the general direction where they're going to tee off, and the whole idea is to capture uh, the click of that club hitting the ball. Other applications, many times you'll see uh, uh, individuals out there creating content for for movies or for videos or podcasts. And um, in some of the uh, more run and gun applications, you get a smaller camera and they'll, they'll utilize this uh, microphone right on top of a, uh, of, a, of a portable camera like this. Once again, we've got a wind jammer on it um, to help reduce wind, uh, wind from getting into the system. And uh, although you don't necessarily need a shotgun to pick up pigs, um, if you step back, if, you, if that camera operator steps back several feet, it could probably still pick up that pig pretty well. Um, again, uh, you can see that this camera uh, lens is pretty close to the front of that, um, the front of that shotgun microphone. So 
if you look closely, it looks like that shotgun is sitting pretty far back in that clip. Um, hopefully it's not covering the interference too, but I think the, the main uh, point there is just a point that uh, there are different sized microphones and many times keeping that microphone out of the, um, the, view, uh, uh, the view of the camera itself is, is a pretty important and critical uh, thing. So many times you'll see, you'll see uh, microphones on, uh, shotgun microphones on a boom pole, for example, so they can keep the microphone out of the view of the cameras, but still capture the content as, uh, as closely to the content, uh, excuse me, as, as close to the sources as possible. So we've got a couple of pictures in the, in the next slide. Uh, here's a couple of operators with boom poles, and uh, once again, those are um, those are uh, uh, microphones, shotgun microphones in uh, the contraptions at the uh, at the end of those poles. Uh, they have the the uh, wind jammers on there, and those poles are telescopic, so they can get really really long. And the idea is there uh, that they can get those microphones as close to the content that they're trying to pick up. Uh, again, as Ben mentioned, physics is physics, and in order to, to capture the content as clearly as is possible, you want to keep that microphone as close to the, the content sources as possible. So uh, many times you'll see these camera operators be several feet away from the, um, from the uh, actor or the, um, the source material, and they'll be holding it well above their head and cantilevering it over and above the talent. So on the left, you can see... Um, if you go back on the left, you can see that these are uh, actual, uh, actually, they're in a mountain, and this application is really location sound. So each one of those operators has a bag in front of them with uh, wireless receivers, but then they also have field recorders and field mixers where they're capturing the content both from the wireless systems as well as those microphones um, and listening to the content through their, their headphones to make sure that they're, they're capturing it properly. And... Um, if we go to the next slide, we can give a couple of examples in, of shotguns in sports applications. So if you look at a baseball diamond uh, and any production of a, uh, of, of a televised production of a, um, of, a, uh, of a baseball game, many times if you look behind the batter off along the first baseline or the uh, third baseline, you'll see a shotgun microphone pointed right at that batter's box. And they do that uh, because they want to capture that crack of that bat hitting that ball. And so as you can see on the, the right side, they've got one facing down the left field line, and the one on the left is facing down the right field line. And whether or not it's a left-handed uh, batter or a right-handed batter, uh, they're able to capture that information. Sometimes you'll see a, a parabolic microphone used in these as well. Now, another way that uh, shotgun microphones are used um, uh, is in basketball and basketball applications. So you'll see uh, mixers for basketball in order to capture content on, the, uh, on, the, on the, the floor. It's not necessarily important to capture what is being said. Uh, they're, they're trying to capture the, uh, the essence of the game. So they want to capture the, the ball hitting the, the floor or the, the squeaks of, their, of the shoes on the floor. And they'll set up this arrangement from uh, microphones on either end plus a couple in the middle. And the ones in the middle typically are on the, um, uh, on the, the table that's on the side where there are per perhaps some announcers or some scorekeepers. And the, uh, the microphones on the left and the right are typically under the, uh, the backboard where the, um, where the basketball hoop is. So in a field of view, Typically, you see uh, the content from one side of the uh, one side of the court, and the mixer will actually mix uh, from right to left as the ball is uh, going back and forth along the court. They'll open up those microphones, and those microphones are panned within the um, within the, um, the uh, within the mix according to their position on the court. So it's a very active process. It's pretty impressive to see the A1s work really hard on that, and they, they, they do a pretty phenomenal job. So if we go to the next slide, you can see what it looks like underneath uh, the basketball hoop. Many times they'll put it right underneath there, uh, and sometimes they'll have a couple. Uh, one will be pointed more towards the court, um, and one will be 
pointed more down so that getting more of the squeaks on the floor directly below the uh, the basket. And what you can't see there is actually many times right before, right below that, uh, um, the rim along the backboard on the bottom, they'll actually place a lavalier in there in order to capture the the sounds of the ball going through the net, for example, or even the ball just hitting the backboard or even hitting the rim itself. Um, and once again, it's, an, it's a very active process, and they, um, they're mixing dynamically as, a, as it goes. It's, they're not just running it through an auto mixer and letting it mix itself. Um, now, uh, many times uh, there's a very important component to a game, which is the, uh, the pep band for NCAA basketball here in the U.S., for example. Um, my own, one of my favorite parts of uh, the basketball game. But um, in order to accurately capture some of that, uh, uh, the music that's going on, uh, you need to pick it up with microphones. So many times that they have the luxury, they'll use some, some large diaphragm uh, condenser microphones in a um, uh, set up in a stereo pattern in front of the band. Sometimes they have to mount my, uh, the shotgun microphones a little bit further away, kind of out of the way, so that they're not blocking uh, lines of sight or anything along those lines. So they'll use shotguns for that. Um, sometimes you'll see those shotguns right on the back of a backboard itself, the, the basketball backboard itself, because uh, many times the band is right there at one end of the court. Now, for, uh, for those applications where you're really trying to pick up some, some uh, far and distant sounds, the uh, deployment of a parabolic microphone might be necessary. And parabolic microphones have the benefit of concentrating uh, a lot of energy towards a focal point, uh, and typically where you place your microphone. So if, if you look at that uh, individual on the left there, there's a, a parabolic, sometimes it's called a fishbowl. Um, that microphone is pointed back towards the, uh, the center of that, of that uh, bowl. And what happens is all of that energy is um, uh, focused on that microphone so it can capture uh, uh, information from a, from, a, from a farther distance. And many times you'll see that on uh, American football uh, fields for NFL, for example. Uh, you'll see it on uh, soccer fields. Um, and this, uh, many times in uh, some of these, uh, these games, you'll see several of these. So they're trying to capture uh, individuals like in, um, in, in American football where they're, the, the individuals are crashing into each other. They want to capture those sounds, those grunts of the players um, from a distance. And they're, they're constantly running back and forth and capturing that information. So, um, and uh, one thing to note is that the size of the dish also determines the frequency response of, that, uh, of, the, of the content. So obviously the larger the dish, the lower the frequency, the smaller the dish, the higher the, uh, the frequency. So now there's a couple different ways you can do that. Uh, you've got um, uh, this, one, this individual on the left might be in the end zone of a, a football game. Uh, and likely they're tethered uh, because they're, they're just staying in that area. But at the individual in the middle, you can see, and on the right, they might employ some wireless microphones in order to carry that content over distance so they can actively run all, uh, all along the field from one end of the, the field to the other. And um, so you'll see uh, not only do they have uh, the microphone, they have a little preamp, if, if you're looking at, at the individual in the middle, they've got a little preamp on the right side of their, of their dish there where they've got the microphone going into it. It's a preamp. They've got their headphones plugged into that. And then they're taking uh, that information uh, and running it to a wireless transmitter, which is on the top. Now, the reason they need that preamp there is they need to hear exactly what they're listening to out in the field. So it allows them to focus that, that dish in the, uh, specifically where they want to pick up the information. Now, the wireless microphones, uh, uh, sometimes you'll, you'll see um, them put on the top uh, of the dish, as you can see on the right side there, and uh, those have wireless transmitters right at the top. Obviously, elevation is good for wireless transmission, so as they're running around, they have those antennas straight up in the air, and uh, they get some distance. All right, thanks, Bill. We'll talk about uh, wireless microphone usage in broadcast. So wireless microphones um, seem like a pretty good idea, of course, and why not? You can cut the cable and everything works well. Um, the pros are freedom of movement and it's wireless, so there are no cables. Uh, that's great. 
Um, but I think uh, our own Tim Veer likes to say that when uh, you remove a one wire from a microphone and replace it with a wireless unit, you add two, three, or four more. Oftentimes, you need a power cord and then another cable and so forth. So it does add complexity on the back end. Uh, we also have to think about things like batteries, uh, whether they're alkaline or rechargeable. It's another failure point or something to keep on top of. Uh, we have more settings and more chances for failure. If one of those settings is set incorrectly or one's not like the others, it can be a challenge. Uh, we're also getting squeezed for frequencies, especially uh, in the U.S. and worldwide. Uh, frequencies are becoming more scarce, so we're having a harder time finding uh, open available frequencies to put wireless microphones in. Uh, this can be uh, an issue, especially in major metro areas or where you need a large number of wireless microphones to operate simultaneously. Uh, additionally, we need to manage frequencies. Uh, we have to be aware of how we're managing our frequencies. We're doing frequency coordinations and spectrum scans, and we're confident that the frequencies we've chosen are going to work for our broadcast performance. So while just like the lavalier kind of situation, well, why don't we just throw a lavalier on everybody? Um, sometimes it doesn't make sense to use a wireless microphone if you don't have to. Um, a good example is if somebody's sitting at the broadcast desk and they're going to be there for the entire program, um, why can't we just have them hardwired directly into the system rather than using a wireless, especially if they're not moving? Um, or a band example, you know, does the drummer really need a wireless microphone? Is he going to get up and run around? Probably not. So um, use your own discretion there. Some of the wireless op options we see in broadcast uh, consist of the three uh, the selections below. From left to right, we show a plug-on transmitter, a handheld microphone transmitter, and a body pack transmitter. Uh, the plug-on transmitter on the left, uh, these typically are very popular out in the field for attaching to the bottom of a wired microphone. Uh, the XLR connector on the left turns that wired microphone into a wireless microphone. It also has the added benefit of adding a little length to the microphone, making it more uh, favorable for interviews or one-on-one -on -one interviews. And uh, overall is pretty much the a good choice for a run-and-gun outdoor handheld wireless microphone uh, interviews. The middle microphone or the handheld transmitter uh, is also popular, uh, usually more popular in the studio application where things are controlled, but you can have a microphone like this with a wide variety of dynamic and condenser capsules. Um, they can be analog or digital and um, they're all self-contained. So the microphone, the transmitter, the battery compartment, everything is all in one and you can manage it much easier uh, than uh, trying to have a plug-on transmitter and other things to have to be all plugged together. Lastly, uh, body pack transmitters are ubiquitous in the broadcast environment. Um, most commonly, broad, uh, these transmitters are used with a lavalier microphone or omnidirectional condenser lavalier, to be more specific. And the smaller, the better. Uh, having a smaller transmitter uh, is more comfortable for the talent. Um, when they see an item of the small stature, they want to wear that because it's more more comfortable and uh, especially for a long uh, period of time. Uh, on the right there is a micro body pack transmitter and uh, it would be the first choice of anybody who wants to use one. Some of the additional resources we have, uh, all of these links, you don't have to memorize them. Uh, if you, you can navigate to them quite easily on sure.com, uh, we have wireless rebate, uh, which discusses uh, all, everything to know about the 600 megahertz uh, auction in the United States and how it affects you, also offering a rebate. Um, there is a resource center for more information on that. And there's a bunch of webinars and additional support materials and training materials available there as well on the third link below. At this time, uh, we'd like to open it up for any questions that may have come in through the broadcast. Okay, great. Um, we don't have a ton, but I'll start. And if you guys have any questions that pop into your heads while we're going through this, please feel free to type them in. Uh, so the question I have here is, is there any particular microphone that is more prone to handling noise and or less prone to handling noise? Well, that's a pretty uh, broad question. Um, without, like without being like specific about specific models and such, typically dynamic microphones have less handling noise than condensers just because they are less sensitive overall. Um, the condensers are more sensitive, so uh, they have to be handled more delicately. And um, 
as Bill was talking about, shotgun microphones and such, those are extremely sensitive microphones and they often have elaborate uh, rubber band or elastic type suspensions so that they don't pick up that type of noise. So uh, it's a long story short, a dynamic microphone would be uh, less handling noise than a condenser. Okay, great. I uh, got another question here that just popped in. Um, one problem I sometimes have in the field is RF interference in, on wireless mics. Do you have any tep- tips to avoid it? Well, yes. Uh, RF interference uh, is a, a large challenge, especially when you're on an outdoor or uh, a situation that's uh, k- kind of uh, dynamic and constantly changing. Uh, there are a couple things you can do. Um, you can, of course, do your due diligence beforehand to scan and make sure those frequencies are clean. Uh, you can also f- select uh, backup frequencies and ensure that uh, your backup frequencies are there and ready to go uh, so that if you do encounter interference, uh, you can be prepared for that. And lastly, um, there are uh, wireless systems out there that can help mitigate that type of interference either automatically uh, by switching to a backup frequency or using other technologies uh, to avoid uh, those type of issues. So um, there are different solutions for that, but um, of course, regardless of which one you choose, you wanna kind of do your homework ahead of time as far as what frequencies are open, clean, and uh, prepare yourself in case one of those becomes compromised during the shoot. We also have a great webinar on frequency coordination. So if you go to shore.com slash training, um, it'll tell you all sorts of great tips and tricks tricks on how to um, coordinate your frequencies to avoid RF interference. So shore.com slash training and just look for the uh, frequency coordination webinar. All right. Uh, next question. Is there a way to focus a shotgun um, to a tighter angle with some sort of modifier? Uh, that's a good question. Um there are certain shotguns uh, available that are like a Colette series that have different capsules and you can screw on. Of course, uh, as Bill was talking about, the longer the microphone, the more directional it's going to be. Um, I'm not aware of any telescopic type of microphones that could be changed on the fly. Um, although, I mean, you could experiment with <laughs> covering or uncovering some of the interference you know, tube uh, slots. But um, regardless, it's probably going to be, you know, the one that you choose would be the best. And then you'd have to experiment to find uh, the best one for the application. Um, additionally, it's why it's important to listen to what you're recording with headphones while you're doing it so that you can see if you're actually capturing the audio in the way that you intended. Great. Okay. When miking a sports announcer, such as in MMA, where the announcer sits ringside, what t- what type of mic would you suggest to reduce the amount of ambient crowd noise? Ooh, uh, that's a good one. Um, typically, you know, you could. Bill, Bill's <laughs> leaning in. Bill, go for it. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. There, yeah. there, well, you have you have several options. Obviously, if you if you want to use a tabletop microphone, uh, if you've got. Um, talent that is aware of how to use a microphone and know that they need to stay in front of the microphone, you can use a super cardioid microphone, for example, or a more directional microphone as long as they stay in front of it. That will give you um, the ability to have a little bit more rejection of the off-axis content. Now, uh, typically what you see with uh, any on-air broadcast where they have color commentary on the sidelines of of any type of event where it's loud, um, a head-worn uh, microphone uh, is very beneficial because it keeps that microphone element really, really close to the source, which is the mouth, right? So, uh, for example, you'll see on hair broadcast headsets from any of the various manufacturers where they've got sealed cups that uh, they can monitor uh, the content uh, each other if there's, if there's more than one or uh, whatever um, the production or technical managers are relaying back to them. Um, and then, uh, and then the microphone actually goes right, right near the uh, the mouth, and it's usually on a boom that you can angle into different positions. So, um, yeah. Great. All right. Uh, next question. Um, referring to the new setup earlier, if I want to hide a lavalier underneath clothing, how can I prevent noise by the movement of the clothes? Of course, while still maintaining clear audio quality. That's a that's a great one. Um, of course, it will vary uh, tremendously on the type of lavalier you're using and what uh, clothes the actual talent is wearing. Uh, as you can imagine, something cloth uh, like cotton may have less noise than something nylon or some or similar. Uh, but the best way to do it is to mic the 
put the mic where you think it would sound best and listen to it um, and have the actor or the talent walk around and try out and see if you're going to get that noise that you're trying to avoid. Securing the cable uh, to the body uh, using some of that medical tape uh, would be another uh, advisable thing to do. Uh, but nothing beats trying it out, uh, experimenting and listening and playing it back to make sure you're going to be okay during the actual broadcast. Great. Okay, what are the little boxes attached to the bottoms of handheld wireless mics called, and can they be purchased? Of course. We, we talked about that in the last section with the plug-on transmitter. Uh, it's just called a plug-on uh, transmitter, and uh, they can be purchased uh, from a lot of different manufacturers, and they are typically compatible with one type of wireless system by that same manufacturer. Um, one thing to note is that when you do purchase one, uh, you want to make sure that if you are going to be using a condenser microphone, um, one that does need DC bias voltage to work, that that plug-on transmitter can provide that bias voltage and make that microphone work. Um, if you get one that doesn't use that bias voltage and you want to use a condenser, it might be difficult to do so later on. Great. All right. Any thoughts about reducing bleed and phasing issues on multi-person panel interviews with lavaliers? Uh, basic microphone principles apply. Uh, so, I mean, we do have uh, a whole bunch of uh, information and webinars and de dedicated to uh, microphones, but things like phasing, uh, if you observe like the three to one rule and uh, the appropriate distance between each microphone, you can do a lot to help reduce the phasing um, and, and issues of that. Uh, you can also use other devices such as auto mixing and, uh, and so forth to kind of make sure only uh, one or two microphones are open simultaneously so that you can avoid these type of phasing issues. Uh, proper basic microphone practices uh, for a panel discussion would, uh, would be good to follow there. Great. All right. Can you recommend a specific shotgun model for the basketball arrangement described in earlier in the presentation? Bill? Well, one, one thing I probably should have mentioned that is that there's no hard and fast rules on how to do any of that. It is, it's very much a, um, a, a personal preference. Um, different A1s or the, the mixers for those types of events use uh, different models of shotguns, different uh, um, varying lengths, um, and you have to experiment on your own. But um, I have seen uh, both medium and long shotguns uh, used in those applications. For example, um, the Shure VP89M, which is the medium, and the VP89L, which is the longer version, uh, work great for those applications. Great. All right. When using long sh shotgun mics with lots of suck, any tips for staying on sound? So how can you stay on sound with a long shotgun microphone? Um, I think the best way... Well, it, I'm assuming... <laughs> go ahead, Bill. Go ahead. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and try. So uh, it, you know, Ben has actually alluded to this uh, a few times in this this uh, this um, webinar. And, you know, listening to your source material is the best way to, uh, you know, guarantee that you're staying on what you're uh, trying intending to pick up. So uh, many times you'll see uh, there are microphone preamps with a headphone output that you can plug in your 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 cans and actually listen to the content entering to the into that um, uh, microphone on the fly. So uh, many many camera operators, for example, will utilize the headphone output on their mixer that's local on that camera to make sure that they are picking up the content that they need uh, and, and staying within the angle of acceptance of that shotgun microphone, for example. Great. All right. Would you ever recommend buying a stereo shotgun mic? And if so, what applications or mediums would this be practical in? Uh, stereo shotgun microphones are uh, not as popular um, as mono microphones because um, uh, the mono ones are a little bit more affordable typically. Um, with a stereo shotgun, uh, they're nice because you have two audio channels and you can do various uh, cool things with it. I would say most of the time, uh, those most interested in the stereo shotguns would be recording musical performances. Uh, it may be also something that would be mounted on top of a video camera where it's a single operator and they need absolutely to get that stereo feed for a true immersive music experience um but of course you know a lot of uh, your mileage may vary whatever uh whatever floats your boat 
All right. Um, we still have a few more questions, but we are about out of time, so I just wanted to wrap things up. Um, I do want to answer one last question, which is, uh, will this webinar be available after for viewing? And yes, as I mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, we do record our webinars, and it will be available for on-demand viewing. It usually takes us about a week or two to get them processed and up. So um, just be patient, and then uh, in about a week or so, it should be available at shore.com slash training. Um, so we hope you enjoyed today's webinar. We hope you learned a little something. I know I sure did. And we hope to see you next time. Have a great day.